Winner of the 2007 Tony Award for Best Musical, Spring Awakening is an interesting show. Along the similar route of Jesus Christ Superstar in Hamilton, it recounts a story set centuries ago with an anachronistic musical genre. Set in 1890s Germany, the story follows various teenagers as they experience their own awakenings brought on by puberty. However, the adults of their society both refuse to let them express themselves and refuses to teach them how to handle their feelings, leaving the adults shocked when their kids eventually make awful mistakes. In order to represent these feelings of teenage frustration, the show's soundtrack is imbued with alternative rock, which made it an easy fit into the music popular at the time, and a unique offering amongst the shows available on Broadway, making it a quick hit amongst the teenage and young adult demographics. This show, remarkable for its own merits, as well as being credited for introducing Jonathan Groff, Leah Michelle, Skylar Astin, Lily Cooper, and several others to the mainstream, had a long road to where it is now, starting from its conception from a Buddhist chanting session, to six different workshops, to its original Broadway run to its recently released documentary. The 24 years of Spring Awakening history, excluding the 108 years the play had before that, are a very interesting ride, one that we will be exploring today. Welcome to your guide to Spring Awakening. Oh God, what a bitch. Spring Awakening is based on a play by German playwright Frank Wiedekind, his first major play specifically, Frühlings Erwachen, Eine Kinder Tragodie, translated to English as Spring Awakening, A Children's Tragedy. This was written in 1890-91 when he was 26, but it was only staged 15 years later in 1906 Berlin. Wiedekin described the play's intention as to depict poetically the phenomenon of puberty so as to facilitate more humane and rational judgments among parents and educators. The original play was viewed as extremely ahead of its time, with its teenage cast dealing with all sorts of serious topics which I can't even outright say here due to YouTube censorship. If you are aware of certain themes or topics that may be upsetting to you, please make sure to check the link in the description for a full list of themes that are involved in this musical. These sensitive topics are exactly what led the play to getting much censorship all throughout the 1900s, including a 1917 New York production that was allowed to go on for only one night and that was only with the Supreme Court's interference. Even the original production had some censoring, with three scenes getting removed. Those that included an onstage beating, onstage homosexuality, and onstage master. Much of the play is somewhat based on Wiedekind's own life, giving it a naturalistic tone. This included being held back in his academic year, having a violent relationship with his father, and two of his schoolmates and his younger brother having committed suicide. As for his own admission, almost every scene is drawn from life. Even the words, that boy was no son of mine, for which I've been accused of crude exaggeration, were actually said. Flash forward to the late 90s. The show was first conceptualized in a Buddhist chanting session in February 99 between singer-songwriter Duncan Sheik, best known for his debut single Barely Breathing, and playwright Steven Sater. The former had agreed to provide music for the latter's play Umbridge, which would eventually become the basis for Sheik's third album, Phantom Moon. Sater said in an interview with the Orange County Register, Sheik said that if we created a piece of musical theater, then he wanted the music to be relevant to the culture at large. I immediately thought of Spring Awakening. And he said musical theater, he made a face. The problem with musical theater is the music's only relevant to other pieces of musical theater. And I said, you mean you want to create something that's relevant to the culture at large? And he said, yeah, the people our age, people, young people. The moment he said it, I just remembered this play, this 19th century German play. Now, Sater had become interested in speaking for the younger generation in the wake of the Columbine shooting earlier that year. And in his own words, this would be his way of touching the troubled hearts of children around the world. I am often asked why I thought Spring Awakening could work as a musical. My only real answer is that I knew and loved the play, and that I long felt it was a sort of opera in waiting, and that somehow I could hear Duncan's music in it. Flash forward to June 99, director Michael Mayer was talking to producer Peter Manning on the phone, and offhandedly mentioned that he'd love to do a new version of Spring Awakening. Only two days later, Sater coincidentally called Mayer up to bring him on board to this new production. Really? And then he the said it immediately when I called phone? him. Wow. He said, I can't believe you're saying this to me. It, it was just astonishing. Said, astonishing. The team believed that the play benefited strongly from its timeless themes of rebelliousness and sexual awakening being held back by conservative values. But at one point, they did consider taking it outside of the original setting into a more modern point in time. I mean, they were inspired by Rent's success, and let's not forget that was also based off an older piece of theater originally set in Europe in the 1890s, 
but reworked to be in 90s New York. In fact, Sater considered taking Spring Awakening to 1950s America, a fitting time for sexual rebellion struggling against a strict society, but everyone involved agreed that losing the original setting would not have been a wise decision, especially Sheik who did not want to compose 50s era music. It was also briefly considered to place the story in modern day, but this was also quickly scrapped. Speaking of music, as the show was meant to represent the struggles and angst that come from being a developing young person, the team thought that the genres of rock and pop were an easy pick, as they've been representing young people and their feelings for decades. Sheik described the music style of the show as having elements of folk, electronic, and 20th century classical music, resulting in alternative rock. Mayer added in the idea of the characters using handheld mics, pulling them out to represent the shift from in-scene to the characters' interior monologues, represented by the more modern sound. Behave in scenes as though it were a 19th century Germany, and yet at key emotional moments, be able to pick up a microphone and sing a song, sort of leaping a hundred years ahead. Another important note from Seder is that when the characters sing in the piece, they're completely in their own heads, as opposed to the various monologues present in Wiedekind's play. Furthermore, as opposed to the golden rule of musical theater that songs should be there to move the plot along, the songs in Spring Awakening exist to delve into the characters' minds and act as a subtext to the action. Finally, another notable part of the show's concept is its use of only two actors to represent the adults, including parents and teachers, in order to demonstrate the faces of the older generation, fully conformed to the way the world is in their minds. It was one of my original inspirations, you know, that the face of adulthood is the same wherever you go. After five days of work between the three, they had ten scenes and eight songs ready to be displayed. Mayer would show what the team had to theater administrator Ann Hamburger, who got the La Jolla Playhouse to host a four-day rehearsed reading in September, which fortunately Ann posted a variety of its highlights to Vimeo. This workshop included various Rent alumni, including Trey Ellett as Melchior, Haven Burton as Vendla, and Carla Bianco as Ilsa. But this would only be the first of six workshops, as despite its seeming success, changes in leadership stopped La Jolla's investment in the show. Sheik and Sater's work would be submitted to the Sundance Theatre in Utah, one of over 500 submissions for its program, which gives theatre creatives a space to bring their concepts to fruition. <laughs> They got in and had three weeks in summer 2000 to work on their project. It's hard to find the actors involved in this. Keep in mind, the cast changed with every single workshop. All I can confirm is that Carla Bianco, Marilyn Kasky, Matt Bomer, Jose Yana, and Roger Bart were all part of this. And of course, no video footage exists, just a couple of images. Following this, the show would next be taken to New York City's Roundabout Theatre Company. Now it's hard to get info about the initial Roundabout workshop, as even the theatre's website has that page locked tight. All I know for certain is that it occurred in December 2000 and that Leah Michelle was included from here on out. I have found a listing for the supposed cast list for this reading, but cannot prove whether it's accurate or not. A second Roundabout workshop occurred in June 2001. Its songs were thankfully recorded and it included cast highlights such as Gavin Creel as Melchior, Eric Milligan as Moritz, Nikki M. James as Marta. Now, this workshop was meant to lead to a full production by the Roundabout Theatre, but this was postponed for both the 2001-2002 and 2002-2003 seasons. The first delay was due to Michael Mayer being busy with Thoroughly Modern Millie on Broadway, and the second one was due to budget cuts after 9-11. The show would be producerless for the next two years. Sater said at this time, all those big producers who said they wanted it, we went back to those people and they were suddenly stumped by the script, all those German names. It was a very frustrating time. Eventually, the show would be picked up by actor Tom Hulse, who would become a lead producer for it moving forward. And in February 2005, the team would bring it to the Lincoln Center in New York for its American Songbook series for another reading, which was considered a last-ditch effort to get the show going, and it included both John Gallagher Jr. and Skylar Astin, both of whom would stay in the cast moving forward. This night was considered by the team to be a bit of a disaster. According to the team, the material seemed not to be connecting with the audience, something they attributed to how often the singers switched, meaning they couldn't keep up with who was singing. Even during the more comedic moments, no one was laughing. Fortunately, it went well enough for it to get a positive review from Variety magazine, and for Neil Pepe of the Atlantic Theatre Company, as well as producer Ira Pittleman, to express their interest in helping the show get properly staged. After yet another workshop in March 2006, which we know literally nothing about, it finally premiered off-Broadway by the Atlantic Theatre Company on June 15, 2006, and ran through August 5, 2006. The Atlantic St. Peter's Episcopal Church 
was where the show was staged, the atmosphere apparently really helping the show's own atmosphere. With its success in the Atlantic, it moved to the Eugene O'Neill Theatre on December 10th, 2006. The show, despite garnering praise, did not do amazingly well tickets-wise. That wasn't actually until their showing at the Tonys, including a massively censored Totally Fucked <laughs> where they won eight awards. It truly started to pop off. Despite the original play and its message being targeted at adults, the show went in a different direction, with its style, cast, and story seemingly striking a chord with teenagers across the US. Many fans would send in letters thanking the cast for helping them deal with their personal situations, and people would be truly obsessed with this cast, shelling out hundreds of dollars to sit alongside them on the onstage chairs. This truly is the production that launched a thousand parasocial relationships. <laughs> Although the cast and fans seem to look back on it fondly. I mean, the show had the benefit of debuting during modern social media's birth. So many videos on YouTube about the show date all the way back to 2007 and have those awful watermarks for unlicensed screen recording software. It truly is a relic. Even Andy Mientes who would end up playing Hanshin in the first national tour and being a big part of the Broadway revival, was discovered by the producers after he launched a Facebook fan group for the show, which would eventually become the official Facebook page for Spring Awakening. Not only would the show do very well for itself, but it allowed for its cast to really get into the limelight, including getting on billboards for a Gap campaign. But what was all the fuss about? What exactly was it about Spring Awakening that got people so invested into it? Just to make sure we're all on the same page, here's a very brief synopsis of the show. Spoiler alert. Obviously. The musical follows various teenagers, particularly three. Melchior, an intellectual type who considers himself enlightened to the world, but is actually very inexperienced to its realities. Vendla, a girl on the cusp of puberty, whose mother refuses to teach her about her budding sexuality and Moritz, Melchior's best friend who finds himself very troubled between an abusive school system, a violent father, and his own growing urges. Melchior gives Moritz an essay on sexuality to help with these urges, and grows increasingly closer to Venla, who's desperately seeking to feel something, particularly after finding out her friend Marta is being abused by her father. While Marta confides in her friends about the physical abuse, she keeps the essay she's experiencing private, which we learn was also the case with Ilsa, another girl who has since run away from home. Moritz is eventually sabotaged by the school to not pass his ear, and spurred on by his father's subsequent abuse, he makes the decision to unalive himself. Meanwhile, Melchior and Venla get as close as two people can, even though she doesn't really know what this could physiologically mean. Moritz is interrupted in his attempts by Ilsa, who prompts him to run away with her, but this falls on deaf ears and he ultimately commits the deed. After the funeral, the school finds out about Melchior essay and expels him. At the same time, a doctor confirms that Vendla is now pregnant, much to her bewilderment and her mother's anger. She is taken to an illegal abortionist and Melchior to a reformatory where he is abused by the other boys. Two of Melchior's former classmates, Ernst and Hanshin, end up together in the one happy-ish ending of the show. Melchior escapes the reformatory and comes across the graves of Moritz and, in a cruel twist, Vendla the victim of a botched operation. Shaken to his score with despair, Melchior nearly unalives himself when the ghosts slash memories of his lost companions appear and dissuade him. The musical ends with him promising to live on in their honor and with Ilsa leading a choral song about the dream of a better and freer time. While not the most glamorous synopsis, this is the basic gist of the show, all intercut with angsty tunes and poetic lyrics. It's easy to see why so many fell in love with it, particularly the younger demographics. It touched on a lot of sensitive topics that I feel like a lot of teenagers didn't have the tools to address, particularly in the mid-2000s. By putting it into a piece that kind of was for those youths, with music that they liked, well, it was the perfect combination. And I'm sure its cast of cute young adults didn't hurt either. However, the piece we got in late 2006 was a far cry from the original play and even from the stuff that was in the workshops. Seven years of writing and rewriting a whole script can do that. So what exactly changed?
Before we can look at what changed within the show itself, we have to compare it to the play that it was based on. Sater, in particular, is a staunch believer that the musical differs greatly from the play, both in tone and in content, stating that Wiedekind's play was much darker and more fragmentary, the work of an angry social journalist. Comparatively, the team stated that the changes they made were to weave more of a plot throughout rather than statements, and to keep the characters more consistent and relatable. Many people think we took that play and added songs to it. Nothing could be further from the truth. We, that's really my book. It's really our script. We really created a new story in the guise of that play. You read the original play and you go, no, there are no liberties being taken here. This is the story that was written originally in the 1800s. Comparatively, the team has stated that the changes they did make were to weave more of a plot throughout rather than just statements per se, and to keep characters consistent and relatable. And we dramatically, radically altered this play, and the exigencies of turning it into a musical led us to create heroes' journeys and arcs and structures that don't begin to How exist in Vedic. How much of the Vatican. original text did you use? Well, it's the starting off place for everything. One example for the changes comes from the addition of several new scenes including the classroom scene that introduces Melchior and the rest of the boys. In fact, we never actually see any scenes of the teachers actually teaching the kids in the play. It feels like this is kind of the point, but the addition of the scene does help in setting up the oppression the teenagers go through. Similarly, the scene of Moritz being reprimanded and abused by his father was not present in the play, but its addition helps to explain why he is the way that he is. The play counterpart to Melchior's expulsion scene involved various school staff, all comedically named. And keep in mind that I cannot say these names for the life of me, including Fliegentod, Ungergott, Sonnenstich, meaning Death of Flies, Belt of Hunger, and Sunstroke. This was carried over into the initial workshop, but was eventually dropped, likely to avoid the teenagers playing adult roles and therefore harm the themes of the piece. The musical would only have two school staff, Er Gnockenbrock, meaning Bone Fracture, and Fraulein Knüppeldick, meaning Very Thick. Another scene alteration came with the placement of Vendla and her mother's scene, where Mama Who Bore Me is placed, which was the first song written for the show, apparently drafted up by Seder in a stroke of inspiration after watching a production of Porgy and Bess. This was all originally placed mid-act one, accurate to where the original play has the scene, act two of the play, but it would become the opening number when the show went off-Broadway. Supposedly, this is because the purpose of the scene, to demonstrate how children will experiment if parents don't listen to their concerns, is ultimately one of the most important, if not THE most important part of the story. Perhaps most notably, however, the original ending of the play was majorly different. While the musical we all know ends with the ghosts slash memories of Moritz and Vendla appearing to stop Melchior from ending it all, the play had Moritz's actual rotting ghost appear without his head and try to convince him to jump off the metaphorical edge. He's then interrupted by a masked man who tells Melchior that there's still much to experience in life despite his current feelings, saying that he will feel very different with a hot dinner inside him. You're not you when you're hungry. Snickers satisfies. Moritz apologizes for his behavior, explaining he's simply lonely in the afterlife, and Melchior leaves with the stranger. The end. Now, the character of the masked man was present in the musical for the majority of the pre-off-Broadway workshops, as far back as the Sundance workshop, at least, where Roger Bart played the part. In the 2001 workshop, he was played by Michael McElroy, and acts as a narrator of sorts to help the teenagers put their feelings into words. He intercepts a lot of the songs and even as the lead singer of a few, which can be incredibly distracting despite his great voice. No sleep in heaven, no Bethlehem. Some pray that one day. His role in the 2005 reading, where he's played by Michael Cerveris, was similar. He just echoed everything that everyone said. Just after Purple Summer, he would be like, Purple Summer. The casting sheet for this production called him a mysterious, contemporary figure for which the boundaries of time and space are insignificant. He knows all and sees all. Should be a great actor with a wide vocal range. They try to include him through a variety of incarnations, as a sort of somber MC, as an ever-present silent specter, as an actor who, living or dead, somehow survived the Allied bombing of a German theater. But he was eventually removed altogether by the time the show went to the Atlantic Theater. Eventually we just had to kill the masked man because it was confusing and nobody liked him, so... Once he was killed off, many of his sung sections were altered accordingly, giving various characters complete lead singer privileges over their own songs, and letting other members of the ensemble take over the more sporadic sections. 
There were 13 cast members in 2001, including the three leads, four other boys, three girls, two adults, and the masked man. But this number was increased to 16 in the 2005 workshop, where they added an extra girl, Anna, and two extra boys, Franz and Fritz, none of which were characters in the original play. Anna took over parts of Taya's role as the more open-minded of the girls, while Taya, in the final version, is set up as a more obey-your-parents type. Well, I always thought that Taya was the mother of Nazis. These other kids um, get so fucked up and, we're, and she's the good girl and you know we have to do what our parents tell us and what does that turn into? The two boys could have been adaptation of the other two boys from the original play, Lammermeyer and Robert, neither of which is particularly developed upon, but there's little documentation as to their actual impact of the plot, so we'll never know. While Anna would remain a character in the finalized product, the two boys would never return, and were removed when the show moved to the Atlantic. Finally, some of the characters' stories and relationships were changed to suit the overarching plot. Some changes included Ernst no longer being in danger of failing like Moritz, and Georg Scrush and his piano teacher. The most notable of these, however, is Melchior and Wendla's relationship. In the original play, their encounter is explicitly non-consensual, despite her very bizarre reflection upon it in her following scene. In the 2001 workshop, the Hayloft scene actually ends with her screaming for him to get away, and him not listening. In the finalized script, however, she hesitantly accepts his offer. According to the creators, we wanted to see him make love to her. More, we wanted to show how this young man first uncovers ineluctable sexual feelings, how he begins to own his sexual identity, how he helps Vendla awaken to hers. Although this arguably makes him less unlikable, it doesn't get rid of the consent question wholly, as she still doesn't know what it really entails and still ends up pregnant. On the other side of the coin, the play contained physical familial abuse experienced by the character of Marta, but the musical added a further sexual element to it through the song The Dark I Know Well. As far back as 2005, the first time the song was included, it was originally meant to have Taya as the lead singer, and the song would have been split in two, with an ominous short chorus after Marta reveals her scars, and then with the full song after Vendla's beating. This would have given further depth to Taya's character, who'd be hiding her own sexual abuse behind justifying Marta's physical abuse. The lead singer would be switched around in the future, with Marta initially taking the whole song, but after feedback regarding Ilsa's random appearance in Act 2, Ilsa was given the second verse of the song. MTI, the licensing company for the show, even specified the two characters are sisters, but this is dependent on the production and is neither the case in the play nor in the musical script as the parents have different last names. The addition of parental essay into the plot raised eyebrows prior to the off-Broadway production, but Sheik and Sater insisted that the song was relevant and deserved to be kept. I will highlight here that Ilsa's original Broadway actress, Lauren Pritchard, has discussed that she herself was abused as a young child, and although she has compartmentalized these memories, she defends that this song is still, unfortunately, very relevant to this day. The plot that the musical weaves is indeed more streamlined than that of the original play, and ensures a lot more emotional consistency, particularly by making Melchior and Moritz less problematic. But I will personally forever wish that they'd kept in the scene between Marta and Ilsa placing flowers at Moritz's grave after his funeral, which gives those two characters at least a little bit more closure. But beyond the changes made from the play, the musical also had various changes and cuts made to its own original songs throughout its seven years of workshopping. What, what, what do you do over seven years? There's lots of little things. I mean, every, t every t workshop we did, the play was essentially rewritten. And, you know, maybe there were 10 of the songs that were written in 99 and 2000, but there are 19 songs in the show now. So there were 20 other songs that cycled in and out of the show over that span of time. Some songs, such as Don't Do Sadness slash Blue Wind, remained largely unchanged as far back as 99, while others were reworked and some were removed altogether. Amongst the songs that were outright deleted, we can highlight a few. All Numb, the opening number, with small solos by each of the characters complaining about how adults behave. It was technically replaced by All That's Known, another song that happens early in Act 1, which is a Melchior solo that serves much the same purpose of setting up the frustrations of feeling like adults refuse to listen and accept new ideas. You're with him now. Melchior's introductory number. Very little is known about this piece as it was only included in the 2000 workshop. 
again, somewhat replaced by All That's Known, although me missing its lyrics is not helpful. Comet on its way. A song that happens early in the musical, as Moritz asks Melchior to write down all his carnal knowledge. It describes the feelings of male adolescence, with the boys describing their attractions and subsequent feelings of frustration. It also anglicizes the names of folks that they're attracted to, including Ilsa becoming Lisa and Vendla becoming Wendy. This song would eventually be replaced by The Bitch of Living in the off-Broadway production Onwards, a more upbeat song that Sheik believed fit the show better. Great Sex. This number occurred during Hanshin's enjoying himself scene. This is mostly sung by him and the masked man, which is definitely not creepy. It generally sounds pretty out of place and basically serves to ignore any subtlety from previous songs related to sex and just come out and say it. Hanshin's scene would eventually become an interlude for My Junk, where Otto plays the song as an underscore. Have you prayed tonight, Desdemona? You don't look like you're praying, darling. All begin to call, a romantic duet between Melchior and Vendla, included in the 99 La Jolla reading. It would soon be replaced by Word of Your Body, which was originally just for Ernst and Hanschen. It was only given to Melchior and Vendla after the December 2000 workshop, when the team realized that it worked for both couples. In earlier versions of what would become the reprise, both Ernst and Hanschen get verses, but it wound up shortened, giving Ernst only two solo lines. There once was a pirate. A very metaphorical song, the Act 2 opener, sung by Melchior and Vendla right after their time together, describing a tale of a pirate and a maiden who could never be together, representing their shame and uncertainty. Despite being deemed a highlight of the show, the metaphor seems to have been considered slightly too confusing, as it would later be replaced by The Guilty Ones, a similarly poetic song with a less confusing metaphor. There Once Was a Pirate would be included in the original Broadway cast recording as a bonus track, originally recorded by Sheik for a demo album that included all the songs in their 2005 version. Once Upon a Pirate Night. In a surprising twist, there was another pirate-themed opening of Act Two. This one seems to have been included only briefly in the show, in the off-Broadway performances, but not in all of them. Between the three Act Two openers, this is the most optimistic of the bunch, less ominous and more wondrous. The musical originally included a second reprise of Mama Who Bore Me as Vendla is taken to the back alley clinic, as well as a Touch Me reprise as Melchior suffers in the reformatory, both sung by Anna in the off-Broadway production. No way to Unfortunately, this would be scrapped, potentially as the double scene was confusing, though the song Whispering has included a brief Touch Me reprise from Melchior ever since the original London run. Immediately following these, there would be a There Once Was a Pirate reprise. In the 2005 reading, it would be sung by the boys, and it would be used when the girls discuss what's happened with Melchior and Vendla. It's an interesting addition as the dialogue it underscores has them try to grapple with the seriousness of the situation, with Marta even convincing herself that it's maybe better to just stay with her abusive parents rather than go astray. As much as I hate it, it probably is for my own good and my father being with me. This bit was shortened off-Broadway to Ilsa reading Melchior's letter and the girls singing this basically immediately afterwards. Until he finds her. 
It was then removed once the Guilty Ones was put in. Now, the climax of the show as of the 2001 workshop was actually a reprise of The Mirror slash Blue Knight, which, as it stands in the current script, is a brief, bizarre, very metaphorical short number. This reprise is basically a one-to-one -one adaptation of the play seen between Mortz, the Masked Man, and Melchior, with just one brief verse sung by the latter. With the bones of a ghost who has nowhere to go, there's no one to see who can see to my soul. It's only when Moritz is left on his own that Vendla comes out and starts singing the Song of Purple Summer. Clouds will drift away. This song was added in 2005, with the previous song's verse being included right before it. Instead of it being a direct copy of the play's graveyard scene, it includes both Mort's and Vendla's ghosts, him telling Melchior to unalive himself, and her telling him to stay alive. No when they are interrupted by the masked man. He clarifies that him and them are simply shadows, rather than literal ghosts. The reason he gives to keep on living is the same. There is much more to life, and the clouds will eventually drift away. No mention of the hot dinner, unfortunately. It would be eventually replaced by those you've known with the deletion of the Masked Man, which itself is a reprise of Melchior's other solo, All That's Known. Those you've known has both Moritz and Vendla fighting to keep him alive, which allows for Moritz to stay innocent in the grand scheme of things in this version. Now, I have found a supposedly early version of the script, which I'm not sure is legitimate, but it includes a brief solo from Melchior as the very first number, which is then reprised within Clouds Will Drift Away. I'm listening now. Basically, no matter what variation of the graveyard scene we're talking about, it was always going to be a reprise of an earlier Melchior song. And these are still not all the deleted songs, as demonstrated on this displayed fax from Seder to Sheik on August 12th, 1999, even before the first workshop. It mentions a few other nondescript pieces, including He's Only a Boy, which likely became My Junk, Racing You in Silence, A Mort Solo, Giving Him an Inch, likely became Comet slash Bitch of Living, and All the Winds That Blow, which was likely the climax song, actually referenced in name by All Begin to Call. Okay now, and thumbs. One thing I'd like to highlight here is that Seder himself has stated his own interest in doing a cut song album, but this is far off on the horizon, so this is all the detailed information we have on these songs as of right now. You said that there were, you know, more than a dozen extra songs that you didn't, because I can imagine some future production that's kind of like the director's cut. The, dra right? the, <laughs> right. the five hour spring the rings, awakening. The ring cycle version. So. You know. <laughs> Not gonna happen. Nine hours of spring awakening. <laughs> My worst nightmare. Beyond songs that were outright removed, quite a few went through some interesting changes. I believe, for example, was originally meant for Mort's funeral, led by a preacher. It stuck closer to the play's version of the scene, with Mort's being posthumously disowned by his father, and Ilsa confessing to Marta that she's hidden the gun that he'd used. With some slight changes, I believe, would be moved to Vendla and Melchior's hayloft scene by the time we get to the 2001 workshop. It would give an even further ironic twist to the talk of heaven and forgiveness and such, as it would build up volume with Melchior forcing himself onto Vendla and suddenly end with an ear-piercing scream from her. Once the scene was changed to include slightly more consent, it would instead end with a gasp from Vendla. In its place for Moritz's funeral, we'd get left behind. In the original play and in the 99 workshop, Moritz's father is still disdainful towards his son even after his death, but this song shifts that feeling to guilt and grief instead. This song first appears in the 2000 Roundabout Workshop, and our earliest available version is sung by the Masked Man, because of course they gave the guy who played Collins and Rent the sad funeral song. Mords' father starts by disowning him, but this song would eventually have him break down in emotion by the end. The first lyrics used to be, You scratch your head and wonder why He was your little gem 
But during a phone call, Sheik told Seder to make it sadder. Seder, at an airport, hung up and immediately rewrote it. The song would go to Melchior with the Masked Man's untimely demise, and good riddance, because Michael Cerveris' version sounds like he's enjoying himself a bit too much at the funeral. Finally, A Song for Purple Summer was always the finale of the musical. The theme of Purple Summer is definitely one of the most questioned metaphors from the show, as even the Broadway cast were confused about what it meant. I don't know, it's about sex, probably, I, I, you know. <laughs> I wish I knew. It might be uh, Stephen's favorite color, I don't know. I think they needed a two-syllable word. I have no idea. Purple is a sign of uh, resurrection, of rebirth. Sater clarifies in his book on the lyrics of the show that it comes from an Emily Dickinson poem. He also notes that it echoes the wound born from the love referred to in Word of Your Body. In 2001, it was initiated by the ghosts of Vendla and quickly joined in by the rest of the cast in a choir-style number. In the 2005 workshop, it was much more of an ensemble piece from the start, with the cast singing bits of the songs in duets and solos, such as The Masked Man and Melchior, and Moritz and Vendla. It eventually went back to its more choir-like version, with Ilsa as a song starter. With a couple of other lyrical changes and added harmonies, the song of Purple Summer that made it to Broadway was surprisingly different from the one present in the album. Only two hours before their final Broadway preview, Sater would teach Lauren Pritchard two added stanzas at the very start of the song of Purple Summer, which helped set up the metaphor of Purple Summer as a time of hope through the land. Even the staging of the show was changed from previews to the final production. Originally, the show ended with the cast coming out in modern-day clothes, representing how the story is still relevant to society. But this was ultimately scrapped. Quite ironically, the cast's clothes now look just about as outdated as their characters' costumes. Although the Broadway production closed January 18th, 2009, after 859 performances, the show has continued to do well. The musical has been translated to a variety of languages and put on with various stagings, some replicas of the original, some completely different. One struggle that popped up with translating the show are its very poetic lyrics. Seder has told the story of helping translate the song My Junk for the Soul 2009 production multiple times. The triple entendre of my junk standing in for my stuff, my drugs, and my genitalia doesn't really translate well to other languages. Ultimately, he chose the drug metaphor as the most important one. Funnily enough, this was also the case for the Brazilian production, which very bizarrely changed purple summer to red summer. Some of the more remarkable productions actually come from Budapest, which actually had the first non-replica production of the show. This one took some interesting liberties, particularly with The Dark I Know Well, which ends with the two girls stabbing a bleeding pillow, and with Ilsa, who wanders around with an armless baby doll, kisses Melchior during Blue Mirror, and nearly has sex with Moritz during Blue Wind. Budapest's second professional production truly strayed from the original, presenting the piece as being put on by a group of students, two of which are randomly assigned into being the adults. The show then evolves into a Stanford prison experiment, where the kids playing the adults grow increasingly addicted to the power of their positions, and abuse their fellow castmates, culminating in them handcuffing and harassing the actors playing Moritz and Vendla even after their deaths. And the fun is not just limited to professional productions. Surprisingly enough, Spring Awakening is available to be put on both by adult companies and by high schools. And not as a junior version as offered by many shows with similarly heavy themes such as Heather's, but rather in its original uncensored version. Duncan Sheik would say about this, I knew that there was a first blush of people wanting to do it, and people were asking Steven Sater if he could do a more high school friendly version of it. It's interesting because really the only thing that's in there that's problematic is the swear words, because the other stuff, that stuff is all directorial. It's not really in the script per se, you could stage that however you want to stage it. Ultimately, while Sheik has given a tacit okay to saying totally effed instead, the most important thing for him is that people don't go against the original spirit of the show. A movie adaptation of the musical has been in talks since 2009, when Empire Magazine reported that Joseph McGee had entered in talks for directing the project. There were several other teases in 2013 and 2014, and in 2020, Sater tweeted out that the movie might finally be happening. However, in 2022, when asked about this, Sater stated, it's in the works, but it's been on hold while the world's been on hold. We've been working on it, though there's nothing specific we can say about it. 
It's something we put a lot of work into. There's a lot of stuff on social media, but what I want to say is that it's not all up to us that this movie gets made. There's a whole world of filmmakers and financiers that impacts every move we make. And even though the musical has not made it to the big screen, it has been used as a plot device in several TV shows. In 90210, some of the characters participate in an amateur production of the show. Even though amateur rights weren't actually out by then, in 2008. Similarly, the 2018 TV show Rise was based on the real-life Harry S. Truman High School in Levytown, Pennsylvania, and its theater program headed up by English teacher Lou Volpe, who directed the first high school productions of several serious shows, such as Les Mis, Rent, and Spring Awakening. The first season of the show's plot had their fictionalized school putting on Spring Awakening, but it did not get a second season. But it did get a new song featured in its version of the musical, All You Desire. All you desire. Created by Sheik and Seder for this TV show. It's framed as journal entries by Vendla and Melchior while they are apart. Seder describes the message as, I will be your everything. Project all your longing onto me and I can contain it. I can contain you as well as me. Which is a very Spring Awakening message. The 2015 Broadway revival from Deaf West Theatre, directed by Michael Arden, husband of the aforementioned Andy Mientis, took a lot of ideas already present in the concept and heightened them with its cast inclusionary of deaf slash hard of hearing individuals. The themes of not being hurt by adults or being forced to follow societal rules struck hard in this production which specifically used the context of the show to harken it back to the Milan Conference in 1880, where educators of deaf students gathered together and agreed to ban sign language in schools and prioritize oralism, the system of teaching deaf individuals to speak and to read lips. Arden apparently did not know about this context when the production was first gearing up, but a Google search highlighted it to him, which made him remove a scene with a deaf teacher in order to double down on the point. This production also used the concept of the inner monologue to the next level, by having the deaf slash hard of hearing actors have an inner voice portrayed by other actors, with added symbolism onto them. For example, Vendla and her voice are first introduced as mirror images of each other, with the voice being implied to be equivalent to an older version of her looking back on her life. Finally, Finally, this production brought Ali Stoker to the Broadway stage, making this the first time a wheelchair-using actor has been in the Great White Way. While widely loved by many, having led to an online repopularization of the musical, this revival was criticized as mostly being oriented for a hearing audience rather than for a deaf slash hard of hearing one. The 2021 West End revival made the brave choice of replacing the guilty ones with There Once Was a Pirate. As well as re-adding its reprise and the second Mama Who Bore Me reprise back in. It also marked the first time Spring Awakening actually did make it to the cinema, as various British cinemas got to show a pro shot of it just this year. This production had the cast in semi-modern clothing with a monochromatic graffiti type aesthetic. Some of the more villainous adult characters wore Comedia del Arte style masks, which led to certain claims of anti-Semitism as the abortion doctor's pantalone mask raised some eyebrows online and was subsequently changed by the fourth preview. On a personal level, I wasn't a big fan of this production, but for its very brief run, it did do well to the point that its director is now the rumored choice for the potential movie adaptation. Finally, there was the 2022 documentary, Spring Awakening, Those You've Known, which mostly focused on the original Broadway cast and their reunion concert for the Actors Fund in late 2021. <laughs> he was like, I've never seen a woman's vagina before, would you show me? And I was like, sure. Oh, a very sweet documentary that I recommend to anyone who enjoyed the original Broadway cast. It felt incredibly frustrating that it focused so much on Leah Michelle and Jonathan Groff's bizarre relationship while I was just trying to do some research. I was so in love with him. Finally, I cornered him at a party and I said to him, why don't you love me? Just love me. Why can't you love me? Like, date me. Love me. Love me. Love me. Spring Awakening is a piece that ultimately did touch the troubled hearts of the youth, much like Sheik and Seder had set it out to be all the way back in 99. While it might have taken a long time for it to get running, and it may not ultimately be for everyone, I believe it's a show that's certainly well worth the praise it's received. For those who got invested into this show all the way back in the late 2000s, to those who got into it in 2015 from the Death West production, to those getting into it 
To this day, it's a unique piece that still holds relevance from staging to staging. And I personally really like it, which is why this whole thing got made. I want to give massive props to the Spring Awakening fandom. In particular, I want to give a lot of credit to Tumblr user Some Play From The Past, who actually had a lot of the archival footage to do with this, a lot of the extra information here, genuinely a massive source of information. Thank you so, so much for that. And for those who are still watching, thank you so much for your time. This was a bit of a passion project that I wanted to get going, and then there were delays along the road, but here we are now, and I hope you really enjoyed the video. I also forgot to set these two books up. <laughs> it's fine, uh, they're here now. Look at me, set designer. Thank you very much.